Okay, let's do some examples of working problems with pressure. All right, here's our first problem. A bullet with a diameter of five millimeters is traveling down the barrel of the gun. At some point in time, the pressure on the leading edge of the bullet is at atmospheric pressure, but the expanding gas on the other side of the bullet has a gauge pressure of 3,000 atmospheres. Ignoring friction, what is the net force on the bullet? Okay, so here's the situation we have. We have a gun barrel, and there's a bullet shooting down it, all right? Now one of the first things we need to worry about is the fact that we've got maybe curved surfaces. I don't know what the shape of the bullet is, right? I didn't tell you what the shape of the bullet was. I just told you the diameter, right? So we've got a diameter here. How does that affect what we're doing? We're going we're gonna to be looking at pressure pushing on the end of this. So the first thing we have to do is we have to do a little geometry. And I'm not going to be like super careful and rigorous. I'm just going to give you the basic idea. If I have pressure pushing on the end of this bullet, right? there's pressure pushing with a force normal to the bullet everywhere which means if there's a point right here there's also a point right here opposite on the opposite side the the symmetry you know flipped around the symmetry axis here um, the inward components of those two forces are going to cancel out right so that component doesn't matter when I try and find the net force on the bullet if I look at this piece and this piece right here it's the component in that direction that adds together, the downward component, um, it cancels. All right, and so we have to do some tricky stuff, right? Imagine, you know, here's the normal to that bullet, and I draw an angle right here. I say, ah, the component in this direction goes as cosine of that angle, all right? But if I look at this right here, right, so here's this little piece of the bullet. If I do a little projection right here, I have a little triangle, this side right here compares to that side as the cosine of theta as well. So just sort of giving a hand-waving argument, what I'm going to say is if my bullet is curved like this, the inward components of force cancel out and I end up getting just a net force pushing this way. And what I'm going to claim is that I get the same force I would get if I just had a flat slug. All right. So that's what I'm going to do. For this problem, I'm going to assume that my bullet is just a little cylinder, so I don't have to worry about the curviness, and I'm claiming then that my answer will be the same. All right? Um, I'll let you think about that. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Let's work the simplified problem now, where I have my barrel here, and my bullet just looks like a cylindrical slug. All right? The pressure on this side is atmospheric pressure. The pressure on this side, the problem said we had a gauge pressure of 3,000 atmospheres, right? That means that the absolute pressure over here is 3,001 atmospheres. Okay, so to find the net force due to pressure, I just take the force on this side and the force on this side and add them together. Let's let this be the positive direction because that's the way the bullet's traveling, all right? So the force in the positive direction, that's just pressure times area, and where the pressure is 3,001 atmospheres. The force pushing the other way is atmospheric pressure times the same area, all right? And this pressure is given, it's 3,001 atmospheres. This pressure is given, it's one atmosphere. I just need to know the area. And of course the area, it's just the cross-sectional area of my cylinder, right? It's just pi r squared, where r is, we said the diameter was five millimeters, right? I divide that by two to get the radius. Never forget to convert from diameter to radius and vice versa. Students lose points needlessly on exams all the time by confusing radius and diameter. You know the difference, just be careful and don't get sloppy. All right, so the net force then is just going to be the pressure over here minus the pressure over here times our area, which is pi r squared. And I'll let you plug it all in, convert from atmospheres to pascals, whatever you want to do. But one thing you might note here is that we ended up taking this pressure and subtracting off an atmosphere which gives 3,000 atmospheres. So gauge pressure, one, one reason gauge pressure shows up a lot is if I use gauge pressure, I could ignore the fact that there's an atmosphere on the other side, right? So kind of, if I have a pressure over here and a pressure over here, I really care about the difference. Since this one's atmospheric pressure, I can just pretend like I just had a pressure over here, which is one atmosphere lower than it is, all right? If that confuses you, don't worry about it. Just always use absolute pressure and things will work correctly. Next problem, water is poured into a U-shaped tube. 
Then on the left side of the tube, three centimeters of oil is poured into the tube as shown on the left. So I have some water in this tube and then I have a column of oil sitting up here that has a distance, let's call it uh, Z of three centimeters. All right, so this distance, I'm gonna call it Z. I give things variable names because I don't want numbers flying around in my equations because then I'm likely to make mistakes. Also, it keeps me from being able to check my answers properly. All right, so it says I've poured water in here. I've poured uh, three centimeters of oil on this side. Knowing that oil has a density of 0.91 grams per centimeter, okay, so we're given the density of oil, and that water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter, all right, so I know the density of water, that's given. What is the height difference between the top of the water on the left and the top of the water on the right? So here's the top of the water on the left, here's the top of the water on the right, I want to know that distance. How do I solve this problem? How am I going to figure out what that height difference is? Well, what we're going to use is we're going to use Pascal's law, which basically says you change the pressure in a fluid somewhere, it changes everywhere. Um, or as we found when we were looking at uh, as how the wa the depth, how the pressure in water changes with depth for a static fluid, the pressure is just right. Or sorry, atmospheric pressure plus rho g h. So the pressure at a given depth in a fluid is the same everywhere. That means if I go over here and I go over here, the pressure here is going to be the same as the pressure here. The pressure here is the same as the pressure here. The pressure here is the same as the pressure here. The pressure here is not the same as the pressure here because these are two different fluids, right? But within this fluid, at any point, if I measure the pressure at two points that are at the same height, those will be the same pressures. That means that the pressure here is the same as the pressure here. So if I look at this, I can, I can look at this problem this way. I can say, um, if I can find the pressure here, it tells me the pressure here, and likewise. Why would I want to find the pressure here? Well, if I know the pressure here, I can tell you that distance, right? Because the water, this pressure right here, at that point, it's just atmospheric pressure plus rho water g h, right? So if I can find the pressure here, if I knew what that pressure was, I could solve this to find h, right? But how do I find the pressure here? Well, I look over at the other side, there's just one thing over here. There's not, you know, anyway. There's just the oil coming down to here, right? So I can find the pressure here because I know the density of oil and I know the height of the oil, right? So the pressure here is the same as the pressure here. It's this thing right here. But on this side, I can calculate it. It's just p naught plus rho oil g z, right? The pressure up here is p naught, and as I go down, the pressure increases, and as I go down three centimeters, it increases by density of oil g three centimeters, right? But this pressure has to be the same as that one, so these two are the same. If I set them equal to each other, I can say, ah, look, so I have these two, they're equal to each other. Um, I can cancel out the p naughts off of each side. Once I've done that, I can cancel the g's on each side, right? And I'm just left with density of water H equals density of oil Z. I can easily solve that for H, right? H is just going to be equal to Z times the density of oil over the density of water. So there is my answer. You can plug in the numbers if you wish. But before you plug in the numbers, we're gonna check our answer. Units, do the units work out? Well, density divided by density is unitless, right? So this side has units of length, and that side has units of length. So the units work out. Do things change in the right way? If I made Z bigger, there would be more oil, it would push the water down more, and you'd expect H to get bigger. And we see that. If Z gets bigger, H gets bigger. All right? If I increase the density of my oil, there's going to be more weight here. It's going to push down more, which is going to push the water up more on the other side. So if the density of the oil goes up, the height should go up. And then according to our, equa our equation, it does. What if the density of water goes up? If the density of water goes up, right, basically you can kind of think of this as a balance. I've got some water here balancing with some oil here. If the density of water goes up, the water is going to go down. It's going to take less water to compete with the oil. So if the density of water goes up, this height should go down. And according to our equation, it does. So it seems reasonable. Oh, one more check. What if the density of oil was exactly equal to the density of water? 
If the density of oil was exactly equal to the density of water, this would all be water, right? And both sides would have the same height. Except this little piece of it were, is oil, right? Even though it has the same, okay, if it has the same density of water, we'd expect the height to be even on both sides, which would mean the bottom of the water here compared to the top of the water, sorry, the top of the water here compared to the top of the water here, that distance would be exactly equal to the height of our oil if the, if the oil had the same density as water. We look at our equation, if oil has the same density of water, that goes away and those two are equal. So I've done all kinds of things to check my equation. It seems totally reasonable. I'm sticking with that answer. Here's our final problem. A dam is 100 meters long. The water behind the dam is 10 meters deep. What is the net force due to air and water pressure on the dam? Okay, so let's draw ourselves a picture here. I've got a dam here. Here's the cross section of the dam. All right, and it goes off to who knows where, 100 meters away. All right, and then I've got some water filling the dam up to a height of 10 meters, right? I'm gonna call the height of the water. Let's not call it 10 meters, let's call it H. Let's call the width of the dam W because we don't like numbers floating around. They make us make mistakes. We'll plug numbers in in the end, all right? Okay, so I wanna know the net force due to the air and the water pressure on the dam. Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kinda of simplify this. I never told you the height, the total height of the dam, but that's okay because this part is in, is in air the other side of it is also in air, so for the part of the dam above the water, the pressure on this side causes a force which cancels the force due to the pressure on this side. So don't worry about it, okay? But for the bottom 10 meters of the dam, on this side we have air and on this side we have water. On the air side, the problem is easy. The force on the left side of the dam is just pressure times area, atmospheric pressure times the area, which is this height, which is the height of the water, H, times the width of the dam. There's the force on the left side. What about the right side? On the right side, we've got a problem because there's not just one pressure. The pressure increases as we go down in the water. Remember, the pressure in the water is atmospheric pressure. Starts at atmospheric pressure, but as we go down, the pressure increases as rho g h. Okay, so we don't have just one pressure we can multiply. So I'm gonna have to break up the dam into pieces that have constant pressure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice this up into pieces this way, all right? Now, each of these pieces doesn't have constant pressure across it either, but if I take the limit as I have an infinite number of infinitesimal pieces, each piece is only at one height, therefore it has a well-defined pressure, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the total force on the right by integrating all of my little dfs, all of my infinitesimal forces, okay? So what is the force on one of these infinitesimal little strips, all right? DF, the force on one of these little strips, it's pressure times area, right? So the pressure is going to be atmospheric pressure plus rho g h. So h is the thing that's changing in our integral. h is the thing that's labeling our slices. Each slice has a certain h, all right? That's the pressure on a given slice. What, is, what are the dimensions? What's the surface area of the slice? Well, they have a width w, and they have an I height dh, right? dh is how far h changes as we go from one slice to the next, all right? So we're gonna integrate downward from a height of zero to a height capital H, and here's what we're integrating, all right? This is a pretty simple integral to do, all right? First of all, the w, we can bring it outside, and then I can kind of break this up into two integrals, p naught, dh plus rho g h dh, all right? When I do the first one right here, this is just a constant, and so I'm going to get p naught times h. And when I do this one right here, rho and g are constant, so I'm gonna get rho and g, and then you do the integral of h, that's just one half h squared. So that's what happens when I do my integral, but now I have to evaluate the integral between h equals zero, sorry, h equals zero and capital H, all right? Now when I plug in capital H, I just get capital H, boom, plus one half rho g capital H squared. And then I have to subtract that from this with zero plugged in, but when I plug in zero for H, this is just zero, and there is the net, there's the force on the right side. So to get the total force, I just have to add the force on the left to the force on the right. 
I suspect that the water is going to push more than the air does, right? The pressure is higher here. So I suspect the net force will be in that direction. So I will let that be the positive direction. So what I have to do is I have to take this force right here and then subtract off this force here because it's in the negative direction. So my net force is going to be the force on the right minus the force on the left. And the force on the right we said was W P naught H plus one half rho G H squared. And the force on the left was just P naught H W. So minus P naught H W. Notice P naught H W. This term cancels with that one. And we're left with a net force which is just one half rho G W h squared. So there's our answer. Now we just need to plug in numbers. All right, but before we do that, let's do some checking. Do the units work? Well, I don't want to, I could, I could plug in units the hard way, right? Density is kilograms per meter cubed. G has units of meters per second squared. W has units of meters. H has units of meters squared. Right, and I can go through and say, oh, is that gonna be equal to Newton's? And in fact, it will be, but here's a faster way. Because I remember this equation right here, the pressure as I go down in a fluid, P is equal to P naught plus rho GH. Ah, if this equation is correct, that means that rho GH has units of pressure. So rho G times a length has units of pressure. So that's a pressure right there. That's an area, right, a length squared, so yeah, it has units of force because pressure times area gives me a force. So my units work. Now let's see if it makes sense. If I increase the density of water, should the net force go up? Well, yeah, it should. If I increase gravity, should the net force go up? Yes, if gravity's pulling down on the water more, the water's gonna push more on the dam. If I double the width of the dam, should I double the force? Yeah, if I double the width of the dam, that's like having two identical dams and I stick them together and count their total force together. Yeah, so if I double the width, I would expect to double the force. If I double the height, do I expect the pressure, the force to go up? If I, if I increase the height of the water, yes, the force should go up. But should it go up as height squared? Right, it, the force increased linearly with W, why does it increase as height squared? Well, there's two reasons that the force increases with height. First of all, if I increase the height of the water, there is more area for the pressure to act upon, right? So that would give me one H, but it should increase by more than just linearly with H because in addition to increasing the area, I also increase the pressure at the bottom of the water if I increase the height of the water. So the kind of the average pressure of the water should go up somehow with H as well, right? So I expect the force to depend not linearly with H, but on a higher power of H. So I'm content now that it goes as h squared. I've done some checking. I have some confidence in my solution. I go and plug my numbers in, make sure they look reasonable, double check my calculator work, and then I plug the answer into my homework. And hopefully I've done everything right now with all of my checking and I get the answer right.